Welcome to the Sensibly Speaking Podcast. This is Chris Shelton, the critical thinker at large. Coming at you on uh, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and with video here on YouTube. This week, I am bringing the long-form interview format to my podcast. Uh, I have a guest I've wanted to have for a very long time. We actually met a while back uh, in Los Angeles at an ICSA function, uh, an International Cultic Studies Association function out there. And then um, we've been kind of Facebook friends. And then we hooked up again at uh, Philadelphia a couple weeks ago at the annual International Cultic Studies Association conference. And I asked him if he would be willing to be on my podcast to share his experiences. And he agreed. So I'm very happy. Uh, Nitai Joseph, hello. Hey. <laughs> okay. And uh, now Nitai was uh, raised in the Hare Krishnas. And then uh after getting kind of out of that or sort of after being involved with that directly got involved with an offshoot of that group yeah yeah i mean my my parents had joined in the 70s uh the main organization which used to be the exclusive one um and then when i was 18 i got more serious than i had ever been before uh, 1718, and was drawn to someone who had broken off in the 80s. His own organization has had uh, quite a number of people at that point. Interesting. So, second gen, <clears throat> excuse me. So, a second gen member of yeah, you were raised with this. Yeah, yeah, uh, and I was I was raised significantly less. Uh, indoctrinated and involved than a lot of my peers. Um, I'm I'm on the tail end of the second generation of the Hare Krishna movement because they started in the mid '60s, so you know they were having kids all the way back then. I wasn't born until 1989, uh, but my parents were still you know early members of of the organization. They joined in the early '70s. Okay. All right. Well, first off, why don't we, you know, I've never had or ever talked with anyone or ever done anything about the Hare Krishnas. All those years in LA. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, all this time on my show. Um, I, you know, in terms of my channel, I mean, I, yeah, I've yeah. certainly seen Hare oh, Krishnas. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, they're kind of infamous uh, for hanging out at the airport, you know, through the 70s and 80s, yeah, right? Yeah. I think pre 9-11. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're kind of infamous for their proselytizing, for the jumping up and down, the yellow robes, the shaving their heads. I think now they proselytize by giving out prayer beads. Uh, I've seen that. Yeah, it's, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I, yeah, that, that doesn't surprise me. Um, it's hard to keep a pulse on exactly how everything's done because different locales, people, you know, kind of do whatever moves them. It's not... Uh, a, a highly like enforced system at this point, um, but I would say the contemporary preaching. I, I presented about this at a conference a few years ago. Uh, they've largely tried to tap into yoga and and meditation and you know other subcultures where there's viable openness to you know Hindu based ideas and and alternative clothing and vegetarianism and and those kind of things yeah let's kind of dive right into this um it's hindu based i i was reading just a little bit about this so so it comes from india and what's the basic i mean it, you know it's it, oh, things that are i mean other than curry i don't know that there's a lot of and i don't mean to you know be brush off here but i mean I indian influence hasn't been a big thing in my life right sure. india is like this other country is you know billions of people over there they have the caste system they don't you know they don't eat cows but I don't really know a lot about India, and I'm going to be the first person to say that. I don't want to come across as offensive or something. I just, it really hasn't touched my life very much. Yeah, and I mean, how, I, I, yeah, what's but. the appeal to Americans? I mean, how do the, how does how do Americans get into this Indian practice, this Hindu practice, and what does it offer them, and how 
how does it you know present itself yeah i think that the first distinction that's kind of worth drawing is in the heyday of the 60s and 70s versus now um, oh sure because it is very different um back in that day you know my mom ran away from summer camp to go to woodstock like it was it was in the ethos uh to be questioning mainstream culture and exposed to eastern things and you know it was it was the the age of that um kind of people being seekers and that being hip and so on so i think that that was one thing um and i could i could speak at some length about that but if you jump forward to today uh I've kind of been calling it, just for lack of a better term, almost like a neo-Orientalism. There, there is this like exoticism with um, young liberal people who uh, are are kind of um, by default averse to Judeo-Christian typical traditional culture and values. There's this assumption that um, there's something better and different about. Mm, more indigenous cultures, cultures that, that that aren't tainted by British imperialism, whatever it may be, there's right. there's um, you know kind of a naive assumption about the other, and and Buddhism has gone a long way in legitimizing a kind of amorphous sense of Eastern depth, and it's it's kind of merging into psychology and, and popular culture and. And so I think there's a lot to untie there, but this this fundamental kind of like, oh, it's not it's not Abrahamic, it's not American, it's not British, like it's probably got something deep to offer is is a dangerous kind of bias to enter into things with. But I think nowadays there is less appeal of those cultures, even the ways that yoga is popular, it's not there's less people looking to sign their life up and for, for some system of transcendence. And that can be seen, you know, the Hare Krishnas are always in time in a union square here. I live in New York city now. And occasionally when I'm in that area, I'll uh, just watch from across the street what's going on. And, you know, they're not moving these these texts like hotcakes. <laughs> okay, okay. That's well. That's and that's of course. You know, we're we're okay with that. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, I I watch because I take pleasure in, in watching. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Um, okay, well, that makes sense. So then well, you then that uh-huh. leads. I'll just wrap up this, this bit that leads into these kind of more insidious methods, which is oh no, this is a yoga studio, not ostensibly connected with Hare Krishna at all and and their kind of flagship contemporary center in the US is in New York City as well called the Bhakti Center and it very much downplays not completely because then that would be too controversial in the group but it downplays the connection with the leader and the Hare Krishna movement as such um, if you look at their website and their promotional materials and things like that. And, and so they've made ties with like the Jiva Mukti Yoga Center, which is one of the most famous yoga centers on the planet, which had its own sex scandal a couple of years ago that ended up in the courts. But uh, so that's kind of how things, as I see it, twist and turn and evolve because groups are fundamentally dependent on people and money. So they act like they're offering this pure unchanging truth to the world but really they're at the mercy of the world so they have to change (laughs) ultimately just i mean i I think that's also some of the liberalism of the current pope is like well yeah at a certain point you gotta get with the times or you're gonna start closing doors of your, your your buildings Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. Okay, now I also was reading, though, that um, the Hare Krishnas own like 50 schools or something and a bunch of restaurants. I mean, this is, it seems, when you, when you on a surface, it looks like it's a kind of really big organization. I mean, are, are there millions of members? I mean, you know, Scientology, oh, we have millions of members. Yeah. yeah no, you don't. You've got a couple thousand. I mean, come on, let's get real. I, I, I mean, definitely, yeah. 
I, I don't know. What do you What do you think? Well, you. I think you probably encounter similar points in Scientology. It's like, well, how are they defining member? Um, you know, how many of those members came once and signed a paper? How many of those members are dead? How many of those members are not involved anymore? Um, right, right. Kind of like that, that SNL parody video yeah. of Scientology, <laughs> you know? Like, those people are still on the roster, probably. <laughs> right, right. So I think there's that. And then additionally different than than Scientology, it is Hindu based, there is existing philosophical traditions that are very similar, that it was born out of. So there's kind of a blending of, of membership into a broader membership of, of what would be called Gaudiya Vaishnavism or Bengali Vaishnavism. Uh, and what what is that? I mean, I, in my American ears, I just go, I, I just tune out. You start talking <laughs> these words, and I kind of, uh, Bhagavad Gita, Hare Krishna, you know, super, super. I, I don't know what any of this stuff means. Okay, yeah. So what what is the 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 structure of the belief? What is, what is it that 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 is that that makes a Hari Krishna a Hari Krishna? Sure, I'll 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 because we have some time. I'm adjusting to the fact that we're speaking at length. Yes, <laughs> um, <laughs> a, a kind of brief Hindu primer. You know, the the very term Hinduism is a bit of a misnomer. It's it's an umbrella term for schools of thought that have immense variation, uh, including atheistic schools of thought. Um, mostly what they share is um, some regard for the Vedas, most broadly, um, and, and, and a sense that those are, are, are evidences that one can build arguments off of. And the Vedas are ancient Indian scriptures, yeah, it's it's a it's a huge body of texts that are in in reality come from different time periods, from different authors, from different motives, certainly, uh probably more so than any other holy text which has experienced its own evolution and, and interpolation. But this is like books and books and different categories and you know, hundreds of texts. S- Oh, in- hundreds of them. So, so analogous to a Judeo-Christian Bible in concept, but Indian in nature. Well, the the Bible would be like the the analogy that's more frequently made is the Bhagavad Gita to the Bible, and the Bhagavad Gita is literally a few chapters of a larger text, which is is kind of classed in the historical documents of Scripture, not even the primary scriptural documents which is like uh there's there's the four different types of vedas uh and i'm rusty on these things so (laughs) no problem i'll spare you luckily (laughs) um but so within hinduism you have that in in the kind of traditional study of it it's then broken down into six different schools of thought um uh, the the Sanskrit term is like darshans, which means like sight. So it's like six different worldviews, basically. And so within those, uh, some of them are theistic, some of them are, are monistic, like so that speak about kind of an impersonal uh, collective consciousness that, that, that the goal of spiritual life is to, to merge with. Um, and so among the theistic ones, there's uh, often Vishnu worship, as a primary god, and so this term Vaishnavism come, is ah. like Vishnu worship, and Krishna is one of the ten incarnations of Vishnu. But for oh. Hari Krishnas and a number of other sects, Krishna becomes elevated to the primary position, actually like preceding Vishnu. Uh, so, growing out of Vishnu Krishna worship. 500 years ago in Bengal, there was this uh, man, Chaitanya, who developed a following around him, and they came to believe that he was an incarnation of Krishna and Radha, which is like Krishna's female counterpart, merged into one body, reborn, and then they found quotations from scripture to try to, you know, say he was prophesized and 
so on. But then the people surrounding him, this was all in Bengal, and it had, like, I think a lot of religions early on, a, a, a attractive, revolutionary, social component, which was it did reject the caste system and and uh like some of his close disciples were from muslim families and and uh so there was and this is all hagiographical too i'm i'm far more familiar with the internal biographies than i am with the objective ones uh which okay I all right. For those, for, and, more for those who don't know, hagiography has to do with the uh, a church created biography of its spiritual leader. Right. So, like with Scientology, part of the hagiography of L. Ron Hubbard is that he suffered war wounds and you know re- right. rehabilitated himself in the hospital using dianetic procedures and <laughs> you know and and he you know graduated from the first class in atomic physics and was a, was a nuclear physicist with all of this is complete horseshit but right right hagiography of l ron hubbard right so you're talking about the hagiography of uh, uh, yeah, okay yeah. yeah so so yeah he was a child philosophical genius who could defeat all the the scholarly arguments like the 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 pinnacle of indian logicians could defeat them and then to defeat his own argument and then defeat that and then convince everyone of the original stance all back again those are the kind of uh tales among other more mystical things as well but so he developed this following around him. They wrote, in some cases, extremely philosophical um, treatises on their own that become scripture for the tradition that then breaks off from there. So while, while a different Vishnu worship sect will consider the Vedas as scripture, we would additionally consider these these books that were written within the last 500 years as scripture, some of them biographies, some of them um, like philosophical texts and so on. And and ultimately it's it's all these extensive arguments from scriptures and logic and so on to say that Krishna is the supreme form of God and Chaitanya is Radha and Krishna come again to inaugurate uh, basically the method of salvation for the current age, which is chanting Hare Krishna. So you see how how <laughs> how it all feeds into these prominent uh, elements. Uh, so so they believe in each age there's a different method basically that's ideal for spiritual practice. And in the past, in more peaceful times, that might have been meditation or worship of of deities and idols and things like that but in the present day things are so fucked up uh that basically it's like the super simple super accessible anyone can do it if you got a mouth come with us (laughs) right and and chant your way out of this miserable existence which is the cycle of birth and death (laughs) <laughs> and that okay and that is the goal then is to get yourself released from the endless repetition of birth and death and birth and death that that hindus believe is the cosmic force or the the, the how how life actually is yeah the material life um and you know hindus and buddhists share that right how one way that Hare Krishnas would try to kind of differentiate themselves or, or one up others that have this belief is we're not oriented toward escape but rather towards service to God. So instead of like simply running away from something, which is kind of a more selfish or more self-interested motive, which is what Buddhists seek to do, which is just like extinguish life uh, done, we aspire to be, and, and just to be very clear, when I'm speaking in first person, this is just a, a artifact. I don't believe any of these things anymore. Uh, we uh, good, good, good differentiation there. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, for for any viewers, especially. Um, so we believed that it was kind of this more noble, enlightened pursuit of eternal service, um, and and this role of eternal service sets a great stage for for abuse in in real life. Um, 
you know, your aspiration is, we would say, beyond self-sacrifice to self-forgetfulness. Like, right. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and, and I'll definitely ask you about some of how that, those sacrifices manifest. I'm curious, I, never have I talked to somebody who actually had any knowledge about this at all. From the perspective then of what you guys were doing, did you consider that Buddhism was a kind of suicide? I mean, where you're, you mentioned extinguishing the the, 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 yeah. the spark. Is that like by breaking free of this, you know, cycle of life after death after life after death, by stopping it or by escaping from it or by, you know, pulling out of it? Did, did you guys think that the Buddhists then were sort of like just extinguishing themselves? Yeah, well, I mean, the language, like extinguishing is, is their language, like putting out the flame. Uh, yeah is their language we did consider it speak about it as as spiritual suicide if you even huh. believed it was attainable at all because we believe that the soul as stated in the bhagavad gita was all these things including eternal unchanging you know can't be drowned can't be burned can't be xyz so it can't be thought into non-existence either um but there is a a similar Hindu variant, which is this this monistic notion of of Brahman uh, as like the kind of impersonal consciousness, and their aspiration is end the cycle of birth and death and merge with that. Uh, and our argument was this is no different than the Buddhist. This is meaningless. You're just uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> and there's more heady heady argumentation as well. But yes, we we regarded that as um, childish and selfish. <laughs> okay. Okay. This, this this attempt to end suffering. Rather, we say you know bring on the suffering if it gives Guru and God even a bit of pleasure. That that's love. You know interesting yeah. and that of course is probably the one thing that hubbard purely drew for scientology as well was this concept of the eternal soul that cannot be extinguished or stopped i didn't or, realize that yeah it never dies that's in scientology they call it a thetan right it, okay, you're, you yeah. are a thetan not that you have a thetan you know and Christ, hubbard always contrasted it with christianity where they say you you have a soul your soul is going to heaven as though that's something you own and you're kind of like well great but where are you yeah. oh well this is very interesting because the the, the prabhupada is the the term the the name they have for the founder of the Hare krishnas um, and just for convenience, I tend to stick with that, even though it has a, an air of reverence in the meaning. Uh, but he would also speak about, uh, like, you say, this is my finger, you know, who is this finger belonging to? Like, you are something different, separate. And, and there is a lot of speaking about the, you're not the body is a very, like, classic kind of quote. Um, Interesting. And I mean, they were in similar regions. L.A. was the headquarters of the Hare Krishna movement for a long time. Oh, OK. Yeah, because I read it had been founded in New York City. So, so they moved to L.A. at some well, point? Well, it's, 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 it's spread as these things do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but but right. He, had, he had landed in New York City and, and established his initial following there. And then I believe there was a trip to Canada or, or maybe San Francisco was first and then Canada. And it's like everywhere he went stayed you know some some following stayed and grew but once they had things like truly underway la was the international headquarters it was also the headquarters of the, of the printing press and the books were their recruitment and their bread and butter once upon a time um so they on watsika avenue in la they still own an apartment complex and the temples there and one of the restaurants is there uh but yeah so i've i've observed um there's this movie Holy Hell on Netflix about this crazy uh, failed porn star actor, cult leader, Michel, and some of the ways he spoke about the guru, and even in pictures I saw some Krishna artwork in the background, led me to think that he may have at least had some exposure to the, to the Hare Krishna kind of terminology and propaganda at some point, being in L.A. himself. Um, anyway. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, and, and again, yeah, certainly has parallels with Scientology in that they're very LA based and, you know, right. Florida based, of course. So, right. what was your 
Okay, so so we basically and, have and can I can I right before we oh. change the subject just yeah yeah. Uh, I think maybe in explaining, although some of this stuff was like esoteric and, and I regard it all as silly, you can see that there is like far more depth and thought just in terms of your initial question about what could attract someone to this. Um, like in many of these groups, you know, there are people who, for valid reasons, um, are, see through some of the norms of society and and are open to alternatives and then along comes a seemingly very well thought out, traced back into history, not carrying the baggage of my parents' Abrahamic faith kind of thing. And, and I think it's, it's not that hard to, to understand uh, the appeal. Absolutely. Uh, uh, yes, very much so. And if anything, Western culture these days has this love affair with, you know, all things natural and natural. I put in quotes. You can see my air quotes here on the on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. I've and uh, yeah, <laughs> and um, and all things, you know, sort of Eastern. You know, they they it's it's more. There's there's a fallacy. I mean, I'd, I'd almost call it the nat nature fallacy or the Eastern fallacy. I don't, I've never heard those terms but I'll just invent them right now. I mean, in terms of, you know, all things that come from not white people are good. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of it traces back to uh, Montaigne, who wrote about the, the you know, and this not idea of the noble savage. It was just this complete speculation that these people with which I've had next to zero contact um, must be living some pure, peaceful existence. And I, I recently had to read his uh, his essay on this for for a class, and it's it's comical the caricature of humanity that he paints of these people like they have no strife and and this and that and uh the women are happy and just xyz uh you know sitting in his estate in france <laughs> uh, so i think that that and and but that um that kind of element of enlightenment thinking has still perpetuated on and I totally agree with your point that there's this faulty assumption that all things natural are good, but there's an even more like fundamental flaw, which is this assumption that there's anything that is unnatural. The most heinous things that arise, be they Agent Orange or, or group dynamics, are naturally occurring phenomenon. We are animals, <laughs> and and so this idea that there it's it's almost a religious idea. And Montaigne said, like everything went down down the tubes the first time someone stuck a stake in a plot of land and, and claimed it was theirs, and as if it's like this injection of of evil from some outside force, right. Like, this is just us, you know, the good, bad, and the ugly. And, and coming from a past like ours, I find that comforting and liberating, personally. Cool. Cool. Well, I'll tell you, the only thing I think that, uh, that I would point to in the world that I'd say is wholly unnatural is styrofoam. <laughs> <laughs> but even that, it's naturally occurring, and that's not to say it's good. That's the point. Uh, right. But but I think even as a child, I had this notion, like when people would talk about organic, my mom raised us largely on organic food. I was like, well, technically, how can something be not organic? And it's, it's simplistic, but uh, I think there's truth to that in observing human history there 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 is no devil there's no bad guy that that screwed up an otherwise uh pre-balanced system uh anyway well I, I i think i'm gonna i think i'm gonna disagree with you because i think that's where styrofoam comes from but otherwise <laughs> i you well, know i think it's devil's tool I, also I also presidencies yeah <laughs> i know i'm, I'm reevaluating lots of beliefs <laughs> 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 All right. Well, let's. Uh, I mean, there. It is very true that this comes from a very intensely rich background, and 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 kind of a tapestry of belief and and philosophy yeah. that has uh, you know a lot to do with how our Western ideas are formed or where they even come from. I mean, there's so much that comes out of out of India. 
that I don't think a lot of people recognize. In the same way I was talking to John Atack about how so many things come out of Arabia that people don't right. realize, you know, I mean, arithmetic and science, I mean, so many science-based things come from this area of the world, and we owe such a debt to that, but there's also this very heady, you know, philosophy and, uh, and religious tradition and it's not all bad. It's not all, you know, it's not all uh, uh, into oppressing people. It's not all about, um, you know, it's about trying to find our place in the world. And as, as I understand it, from the limited amounts that I have read when I was in Scientology, I read some of the, you know, I read some stuff about the Vedas and, and about um, the tradition of it because Hubbard, you know, makes references to it. And he says Scientology uh-huh got some of its concepts out of the Vedas, uh-huh. you know, and, and he, and, and you can't help but draw parallels. Um, but of course, nobody really figured anything out until Hubbard came along, but you know, it was, <laughs> it was the roots of, of some of it were there to be plucked. These, you know, these, ripe, these, these ripe yes, roots. That's right. Exactly. So he's, he, he refers in the backstory to some of that. And he also talks about the Buddha and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot there. Um, but now let's kind of talk about your upbringing and how this can get kind of twisted because there's a difference between we, I I think you and I are on the same page in terms of, you know, the belief system is one thing, but when you, when you start talking about destructive cults or high control groups or, you know, these, this, the coercive persuasion, you're not, you're not talking about a belief system. You're talking about a, a relationship between a leadership and followers, and you're talking about control structures. What? Let's talk about that aspect of it in terms of your upbringing. Yeah, um, I do want to tag on one last caveat to the last subject. Just to be fair, Hare Krishna is not without an influence of British imperialism also. Um, you know, ah. the, found, the founder was raised in that environment. His guru had kind of done this almost like Victorian moralistic revamping to of, of the religion because it was seen locally as kind of morally bankrupt. And so to be more contemporary and appeal to people with power, um, he even like there's photos of his followers wearing like priest collars. He tried all sorts of different things modeling himself in part after uh, another Hindu group that had modeled itself after Christian missionaries. So there's all these tie-ins. Also, the founder was a a follower of Gandhi, and Gandhi's thought was heavily influenced. Uh, You know, Gandhi is not Indian. He is British Indian, fundamentally, um, in his thinking. So just to be fair, in my in my point that, you know, basically the East can be pretty crappy too. Part of the crappiness in my experience was still tied back into the West. (laughs) So, right. um, Anyway, so that, that aside, as far as what you're saying about beliefs and, and um, damage or or control and harm and and my experiences, I do agree. I, I think that beliefs, are very tied to the forms that control takes, the responses that it takes, and and the effectiveness of it. But when we're speaking about public education or legal action, you know, you look at the facts. um, Because yes, fundamentally, someone can hold any belief they want. Some of those beliefs, my point is, I guess, are, are lend themselves to destructive behaviors more than more than others you know there's a reason it's a lot harder to form a militant humanist cult like (laughs) well of course i i don't want i don't mean to divorce them completely no 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 it's it's a point that kkk has this kind of crazy idea that you know black people are you know the ultimate evil that might lend itself to certain, you know, behaviors that we might not like. Right. I guess it's a it's a point that I've been harping about, I guess, within this kind of cultic studies realm, because I think to combat stigma, validly, people like to point out like it's it's uh, it can happen to anyone. It's not about the particulars of beliefs. It's about these certain dynamics, and that's valid. But I also think when you'd get into the nitty gritty, I find it very fascinating to explore how the beliefs shape and intertwine with the abuse 
Um, but as far as my upbringing, I guess, uh, I was raised what what the Hare Krishnas call a fringy, like fringies is kind of like lapsed Hare Krishnas who still have faith, but they're not strict. They're not necessarily following all the rules or showing up all the time. So by the time I was old enough to form memories, my mom was kind of moving in that direction. My father left before I was two, um, in part because the group very much emphasizes celibacy, men specifically, uh, family is seen as a, a, a shortcoming, a, like a fall from, from grace for men who basically can't resist sex, so they have to get married, and sex is only for making babies, so you have babies, and then if you turn around and leave your family to continue preaching, like, more power to you, kind of, is, is the environment. So at one point, my my dad's also not. I'm not. I'm not a fan. Uh, growing up, at one point, there was a cassette tape in our house. He had mailed to my mother. It was one of the eleven successors of the whole Hari Krishna movement when the founder first died, and there were initially these eleven. And my father was close with this one, and it was a lecture of his where, from the the seat, the elevated seat of the lecturer, he was directly praising my father for having like left our family um <laughs> uh so while i wasn't like and and to be fair i'm happy my father wasn't in my life um i i think that that was better than the alternative um and we've had contact at times we're not in contact at present but uh I don't lament that, but it's still disgusting. <laughs> I, can, <laughs> I can recognize. Well, you know, unfortunately, I have to say, being at the other end of that from my own experience, where I was the <laughs> father who wasn't around for my son while he was growing up, you know, I very much lament my, and reg- right. it's, it's my biggest regret. You know. Right, and and he doesn't uh, to this day have have any kind of sense of remorse, which like on an emotional level, I, I don't feel in need. He was gone before I could form memories of him. My earliest memories of him were him visiting and being an unpleasant human. Even as a kid, I remember being happy he wasn't around. But it speaks to his own character that he doesn't have any sense of like uh, remorse or or uh more nuanced feelings about it's kind of like oh life happens and i'm like yeah i agree but that's because you know i was in a fucking cult <laughs> and, right. you learn, and you learn to be detached is he still part of that or he left that no he's an interesting case actually he uh was a fairly prominent speaker and writer uh and eventually began writing books critiquing the movement from within it advocating for reform but he was studying psychology kind of on his own and also i think taking some courses and he was really influenced by some people who i still hold in higher like eric Fromm, who was a humanistic psychologist in the 50s brilliant and so my father was writing these critiques and it's sometimes very scathing uh he wrote a four book series called our mission and it included like comics that that mocked the the leadership and 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 intelligent criticism as well and so he kind of garnered his own following from that and this was like in the early to mid 90s after he had left our family and was living primarily in india and there were people who wanted him to become a guru and so on eventually in his independent nature he wrote another book with another member that challenged the institutional stance on what the origin of the soul is. <laughs> and that's what got him kicked out. Okay. <laughs> okay. We'll take some criticism, but hey, buddy, you know, but like, you don't, went too far. don't mess with the completely hypothetical, unfalsifiable <laughs> elements. <laughs> right exactly you know, Scientology is really great but this whole Satan theory I don't know about that you know let's let's uh right, right. you might get kicked out they might and it's like this very that. obscure 
absurd once you're out of it kind of debate, which still rages on to this day, which is basically like, was the soul in Hare Krishna heaven and fell down because it was envious or was it always in the material world to begin with because uh, God is kind of unfriendly. <laughs> I, I'll tell you, the people who get into arguments about that kind of stuff just boggle me. I well, I was uh, very much one of them for years. Oh, I just, I, you know, when you like, and the and the and the point being what you said, unfalsifiable. How do you argue with somebody about two claims that neither one of you could offer a shred of evidence? Or well, see, form? because if both of you have accepted a shared text or group of texts as evidence, then you at least have the Plato to create these arguments with, you know? Um, And that's what it is. It's just endless, endless uh, debate over contradictory, ambiguous texts. So it's like, they'll, they'll never run out of fodder. Right. Right. You can definitely make a make a lifetime study out of that sort of thing. Many lifetimes. Many lifetimes, <laughs> yes. So, okay, so you grew up, uh, basically, dad wasn't around, mom was sort of moving away from the whole thing. So what happened that you ended up in this other offshoot set well, of this? What's, what's the in-between there? Yeah, I, I mean, my mom wasn't moving away ideologically. She was lapsed more so than uh, okay. Else. Um, and she was struggling very consciously with her sense of identity and having spent 19 years living in temples very devoutly, like, who am I now? Like a lot of the things that ex-members very typically struggle with, but... A, a key to to that resolution is letting go of the ideology that's bound you to it anyway. So my mom never made that that step. So for her, it was just like this this immense shame and depression and all these things born of an awareness that her life had like been stifled and there was something very unhealthy about all these things, but a complete faith in the belief system and just this intense emotional devotion to the founder who she had seen one time in person in an airport um, when she was 19. And, you know, we're talking 40s, 50s at the time. So, uh, so while I wasn't like overtly indoctrinated heavily, I went to public school. Most of my friends were not second generation members. It, it, it permeated the backdrop of my childhood experience in, in various ways, another being her kind of suspicion or reluctance for certain medical treatments, not that she was completely against traditional medicine, but she certainly leaned alternative. So uh, when she had cancer and then MS, sometimes... Um, I, I think that basically her her ailments were exacerbated by elements of of the cultic beliefs and and attitudes, um, and certainly her her mental health was was struggled. But the people who I was raised around were similarly varying degrees of fringy Hari Krishnas, my mother's friends, and sometimes we lived with other people. Um, And then I had an older brother in the house and uh, he had been more indoctrinated as a child and eventually in his late teens uh, had a kind of dramatic drug experience. I don't want to air too much of his stuff, but, but after the fact, he became very extremely devout and serious about the religion and began traveling around uh, in America, in North America with it. Uh, and that is when, on one visit home, he he preached to me very thoroughly. Uh, I was I was like fourteen years old and and lacked um, <laughs> lacked the rebuttals for this uh, science of self realization that had been in in some ways refined over hundreds of years. These arguments are the fruit of hundreds of years of thought. And even in Scientology, where it's much younger, nonetheless, he pulled from other places. So I think that's another point about 
how people get recruited. These aren't, you know, on the surface passing by, it looks like some crackpot stuff, but but the, the building blocks of these weird beliefs are can be quite sturdy um, if you're not informed or, or whatever, intellectually inoculated, so to speak. Um, so that had a huge impact on me. I had already left public school because I was hanging out with older friends. I thought I was too cool. And my mom's anti-establishment kind of general attitude fed perfectly into leaving public school. She had always said, you know, if I wanted to do homeschool, I could. So now I'm like a 13 year old starting to smoke pot. And I'm like, yeah, I want to leave school. And she's like, okay. Uh, and the founder of the Hare Krishna movement here, again, you can see the influence. He's famous for saying and often quoted that secular schools are slaughterhouses of the soul. So while my mom was not a fanatic of that caliber, it's not like that thing has no influence in, in someone's mentality. So, so uh, you know, my life kind of went off the rails from that point. I was 14 years old. I got a job. I worked full time and, and never did I kind of fit back into a typical mold again. <laughs> okay. Okay. Interesting. And another aspect of the cult, you know, the cult leader playbook, you know, the cult leader 101 is a separation from, from, from educational institutions. It's interesting because, uh, you know, Al Hubbard never said public schools are the slaughterhouse of the soul, but basically he did right. by ragging endlessly on colleges and schools and education in the system and how how miseducated everybody is and how they can't think and they don't know anything because schools are taken over by the psychiatrists and oh right i forgot yeah they're just psych written you know uh and anything anything psych is is absolutely black and and evil and horrible so uh so that was so he killed it all by association Uh, but i just i just marvel at the at the parallels when i when i talk to people because you and i didn't have any sort of pre okay well we'll talk about this and this and this and this yeah no It, it just rolls out and you just go well yeah of course there it is you know, right, right. another aspect of it you know yeah it's absolutely true uh the the presentation i just did with a friend in philadelphia was about basically the ideological um components that lend to child abuse and some of the quotes we had pulled out for this are the founder speaking about the schools that they then started and how you know a little math maybe a little this but we're teaching them to be servants of of krishna and like uh serve a guru and serve god and like that is primary that's what these schools are for and so the very first one had horrendous horrendous abuse and then it got shut down and they mostly started moving them, the main ones, to India, where there's far less oversight. Especially wow, that. yeah, I get but it. But anyway, I don't want to get too far off. I forget where we were. No, point. well, I was asking you about the transition period there from, you know, when you were a kid to going from, you right. know, your, your, your mother sort of lapsing but still believing, then your brother comes along, that starts making some sense now as to how you got involved in this offshoot group. Right, so... Um, at 14, I had this literally one day, it's very, very salient in my memory, uh, where my brother like preached to me a whole bunch. And that day I concluded, you know, well, shit, he's right. I, I don't have um, rebuttals to these points. This is probably what I should do with my life. But I wasn't ready to stop hanging out with friends and stop smoking and stop drinking and just living the life that I was living. Um, But it was there. I I call it like a, like a virus kind of like it was like there and festering for, for the following few years. And I progressively became disillusioned with my life because, because that's what the ideology was. It was you're miserable, whether you know it or not. That's like the first step. Um, And so I, you know, became less and less satisfied with my friends for whatever reasons, you know, so like judgmental moralistic stuff starts arising. uh, And, and I quit my job eventually. And I was thinking about like pursuing working on a farm. And um, I was actually going to go do that with a friend who wasn't affiliated. And he commits suicide right before we were going to go do that. I was 15 or 16. And he was 20 
21 or 22 or something. Um, and at that time I was like, well, I should stop beating around the bush. Like the farm stuff is just like a, a segue into giving my whole life to this thing. So I should, you know, be serious about that. And from that point, I basically stopped hanging out with friends, wasn't working, was living at home. And my life became reading Hare Krishna books and chanting all day. Uh, and when I le needed leisure, I would watch these, <laughs> yeah, I think probably over a hundred hours of video of Hare Krishna members describing their memories of the founder, just like personal anecdotes, like hundreds of hours they videotaped. Uh, and so that was like my, my relaxation time. And I did that for months. And, and so I very quickly imbibed a lot of the doctrine that I hadn't previously been necessarily like deeply familiar with. And I started listening to a lot of lectures and in my kind of circle, my mom and her friends, the guy who would become my guru, uh, his lectures were circulating as CDs. He had like a monthly CD service. He had recently come to the East Coast and spoken in, in Maryland, which is where I lived. Um, so I was exposed to his. And by that time, my brother had left the main Hare Krishna organization, uh, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, and he had joined a different offshoot in India. So I was kind of like my horizons were broadened beyond this one group's sectarian borders, and I was far more drawn to this other speaker's um, writing and, and thinking. And he was more liberal, he was more intellectual, uh, and so after several months, I, I, I came in contact with them. I was like on a private forum and, and kind of having contact with him and his followers as I was participating full time in the local temple in Baltimore in an in a institution that dislikes him. So there's all this infighting, you know. This, I, I have to ask about this for a second because this is so different from my experience with Scientology <laughs> uh, where, you know, it's very, very young and, uh, and they fight hard for, you know, against offshoots or anybody, what they call squirreling. You go take, some guy goes off and takes Hubbard's work and goes and does his own thing with it. He's a squirrel. <laughs> you know, that's what they call it. Because Hubbard, Hubbard came up with this derogatory term because he's, you know, he's just chasing that nut. He's just, he's just going on a, on a, he's just running after a, a nut. You know, he's just, yeah. he's a nut. And that was the association, right? So anybody, if you're not on the main line, you're a nut. Right. And, uh, and so they, you know, so they have all these terms for this. It, it seems though, I, I'm marveling at what you're saying because I'm like, it seems like anybody can just step up and say, Hey, I'm, I'm the guru of the week here and here we go. Yeah. And I got, yeah, how does this work? How do these, how do all these people just pop up and go, I'm a guru now, listen to my lectures. Uh, it's not, it's not that arbitrary by any means. Okay. So within, within the Hare Krishnas, almost all the gurus are swamis. They're men who have vowed to lifelong celibacy and they carry a big phallic, uh, bamboo stick that isn't, I mean, it's not intended to be phallic, but I, I interpret it that way <laughs> at this point in my life. Um, and uh, so already your pool of who's actually a potential guru is very limited. There are some exceptions to this, married men becoming gurus, but it's, it's quite rare in the international scene. Uh, so the guy who became my guru, he had been a very prominent Swami since the 70s. He was the most famous bookseller in the heydays of bookselling. They would fly him around the world for him to train other people in his coercive used car sales tactics. Uh, and, and so I, I, I picked well, obviously. <laughs> um, so what happened was after the founder died, these 11 people had all the power they started dropping, uh, you know, sex scandals, child abuse, stole a disciple's wife, and he cut my head off. That's how one of them uh, left the scene. Yeah, one of these 11 gurus was decapitated by his own disciple. Um, okay, crazy. damn. That, wow. There's, there's tons of, of just, like, fascinating stories that uh, we could get into. But to, to wrap up the guru kind of distinction, 
So typically it's someone who already has some prominence and people already revere them. Um, sometimes that's purely based on a position and people just being deferential and, and naive. And sometimes it's based on charisma or intelligence or whatever it may be. Um, they're typically the ones that become gurus either when their guru dies it usually splits even if the guru has been very clear i want this person to run everything there's always some splinters um and this is how like the sunni and shia split originally it's 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 succession drama you know okay <laughs> it's it's i think it's pretty like nearly unanimous uh it's interesting with scientology is so unique in in its business like lack of religious kind of existence that that maybe it was easier to maintain kind of singular power than with some of these others but so yeah it's not typically that gurus pop up and if they do the community that they come from will often reject them and then they'll have to kind of restart in a vacuum with people who don't know the history and who are willing to kind of buy their their wares um, just on the basis of who they are independently. And there's there's crazy circumstances of that. Hare Krishna is completely breaking off, starting their own thing. There was this, this one guy in South America several years ago and 400 photos of him having like very kinky sex with his disciples were leaked onto the internet. Um, so you're not entirely wrong that any any crackpot with a distorted sense of self can <laughs> kind of start working on a on a following with varied success. Yeah, it kind of seems to me that you know a, a ragingly popular Swami moving up to guru status would be, hey, I had a revelation, and it turns out actually we can't have sex, and in fact we can have as much sex as we want. In fact, everybody gets to have sex with me because I am the Swami guy, and also with each other and hey, let's just have at it and doesn't change a word of anything else with the belief system. I'm sure there would be plenty of people who would just, you know, yeah. hop on board, you know. And that's probably occurred in very small pockets. The kind of public, if you will, the within the international scene, its own public sphere, uh, is far too conservative for that to like catch on on a large scale. Uh, but even my guru, for example, part of his, um, I call it sometimes Hare Krishna 2.0, was like becoming more liberal, more intellectual, not not being against homosexuality. So he had uh, quite a few gay disciples and people who had been in the other organization and been mistreated and become disillusioned for that kind of reason and then they see him as this alternative so almost all of our membership came through disillusioned look like stragglers <laughs> from right from other right. groups but he did implement some things that were more so instead of sex only for procreation or even sex only within marriage he would say sex only within a committed relationship so he was kind of trying to make these more contemporary allowances um for various reasons he's still unable to to garner a large following or or lots of money which i'm thrilled with but uh he's ahead of the curve nonetheless with a lot of these things and i think in time the larger organization will end up following suit as they slowly try to you know update their own presentation right right exactly and i just threw sex out by the way as an example i mean you could have eat bacon on thursdays and i'm, I'm sure people would flock to it as well <laughs> what <laughs> um <laughs> okay, so now where does where do these people cross the line in terms of um you know when we start talking about high control groups, we start talking about you know deep impingement on people's personal rights and human rights and personal freedoms, right? Um how does the Hare, how do the Hare Krishnas or the Splinter group you got involved in specifically do that? What how does that manifest? Yeah. Well, I can't uh it's just the way I think I can't um, escape the belief component as like the, the kind of foundation, which is unlike, 
um, a lot of Bible-based groups, I, I believe, unlike Scientology and, and various other groups, while they're all authoritarian, these Eastern groups, guru groups, have this very explicit, like, subjugation tenet. Like, this person knows more about you than you are possible of knowing, and your best fortune will be to sign over your sense of self and right and wrong to them. And with that, they'll kind of help make you into your highest potential. It's like this very explicit authoritarian subjugation um, belief that I think, frankly, is all one needs to know. Now, my view is that's all one needs to know most essentially to um, identify it as authoritarian and, and abusive um, or very quickly headed that way. Uh, well, let me ask you this. Let's explain the difference for somebody who might say, well, that doesn't sound inherently abusive. And by that, I mean, the first thing I start thinking of is you have spiritual leaders in all kinds of faiths. Um, you know, your Catholic priest for example, is a spiritual leader, let's say, for a community. Sure. And I think any person under, you know, Cardinal O'Shaughnessy or whatever, right, would, would, uh, would say, well, he certainly knows more than me about God and about how my place in the universe, I leave it to him to guide me as to my spiritual path and how I should you know, uh, yeah. confession and, you know, he says to do this, I do it. He says to believe this, I believe it because that's how I will get into heaven and that's how I can be forgiven of my sins. Sure. And I would say that they probably wouldn't say that that's an abusive relationship. That's a spiritual relationship that leads to some kind of salvation for them. So where does the, you know, are, are these people taking advantage of this relationship in some fashion or what? what, what? Yeah, I, I think a few things uh, come to mind. Um, even therapy has this dynamic. And when I first left and was in therapy, therapy was difficult for me because it was like, oh, look, I come, I sit in front of this dude. I tell him everything about me. He tells me nothing about him. And then he like steers my life. Uh, so and you I got, and you have a very valid point there. I, yeah. So, so I understand the point that you're making. I think that, that there's a number of, of factors that come into it, but one is, is the aim, the fundamental difference, which is what I realized for myself between my disclosure and, and regard for my therapist versus for the guru in the past was the therapist's had as the objective my autonomy facilitating my autonomy it, it he didn't have a predetermined notion of what my best life is going to be he might have a predetermined notion of certain principles broadly um which are also more evidence-based and <laughs> and any number of things but the guru in the Hare Krishna is the belief is that once you finally you know beat the game of life and death, um, you take a form in basically a North Indian village setting where you live these day-to-day playtime with Krishna, either as a lover or a friend herding cows. or So it's literally a very specific, this is your afterlife and all your life's leading up to it. This is how you should live, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas in like, let's say maybe in the middle between these, you could place a pastoral counselor or, or a priest or something where they're not like my, my cult leader was, but they're also not necessarily a therapist that, that has this very broad sense of, I just want this person to uh, flourish as they define that. So in, in a Catholic setting, that definition is a little more, confined they have a, a specific notion but if it's not abusive it's also not going to be like anti-world these people give advice that pertains to the immediate well-being of those who who follow them you, you know what i mean whereas the Hari krishna tell me more so the Hari krishna idea is like being attached to your family is bad uh 
being successful is bad because it's like a sign of your material desires or your ego or, or so on and so forth. So that is reflected in the feedback that you get from your, your trusted advisors. In more mainstream churches, there's more mainstream integration. There's more, I think, overlap with between spiritual ideas or spiritual like ideals and methods and, and humanistic ideals and methods. And part of that is there's more accountability to, to, to the public if you're a mainstream church. Um, so this, I guess, ties in broadly to, I view all of this on a continuum. I, I typically try to use the word cultic and not cult at all to, to just always imply that this is a spectrum of dynamics. And some of them can appear here, some of them elsewhere, two people in the same well-established Catholic church can have very different experiences. One of them can experience abuse and, and some of that's subjective. That's also there. So, so um, I guess my first rebuttal whenever it's like, yeah, but what about mainstream churches is like, well, you know, they're groups of humans too. So <laughs> right. they're, they're certainly well, I, not a gold standard. And for sure. I'm sort of thinking right now about um, monks I'm, um, you know, aesthetics, right? People who purposefully, knowingly, with with uh, which, which I was. I, we haven't mentioned that. It, oh, okay. But I was. So anyway, finish. Your oh, thought. okay. All right. So, I I think I assume, or people assume, that when somebody enters the monastery or uh, a, a nunnery, I guess that's the right word for for where nuns go, um, that they know beforehand. There's informed consent. I mean, the person absolutely positively knows <laughs> from what I've read or been told in terms of that lifestyle. I'm not talking about the Hare Krishnas now. I'm talking about, let's say, again, the, 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 the Catholics or deep, you know, Christian sure. Sure. groups, right? These people are going to, in fact, I've been told that um, in some cases they're, they're almost actively discouraged from going into the lifestyle beforehand yeah. because they're told, look, man, these vows are not a joke you're going to go do this and it's the rest of your life and you're giving up bacon, you're giving up TV, you're giving up Star Wars, you're giving up like all that is, is, is of the past. Now you're dedicated to God. Right. Right. So, so I kind of get the idea it's that what you're saying is it's this level of commitment, but maybe not fully informed consent or what's, what's, what's the difference? Well, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe if, if all goes well, we could do a whole, episode about like uh monasticism celibacy this component i think there's some really fascinating things that emerge from it um we in our efforts to be contemporary instead of calling our place an ashram we referred to it as a monastery and instead of calling ourselves brahmacharis which is like a sanskrit term we at least publicly referred to ourselves as monks so my identity for those uh years from 18 when i moved to california uh, until uh, like 24, roughly, um, was that I was a monk. And interestingly, with what you're saying, I got quite into reading about monasticism in other more established traditions. One of the ways the guru kind of kept me hooked, you know, for different people, it was whatever was suitable. But for me, he, he had this notion that we were kind of developing a more formalized monastic order that was going to be kind of new in the international Hare Krishna world. It was like healthier, you know, more systematic like Buddhists have done, like Christians have done. So that was BS, but thinking that was not BS, I w was into reading a lot of Thomas Merton and uh, other like texts on Catholic monasticism, even like how they structured their daily lives. And so it's, it's a certainly an interest of mine. And you're absolutely correct that in more established systems, you will have far more safeguards. I don't think that you can ever this stuff doesn't exist in a vacuum. So you can't say that there's fully informed consent if someone grows up in a household where their parents, the only person they've ever seen their parents respect is a priest or, you know, something far less subtle than that. This is also my issue with, with liberal people, which I, I am one, um, 
kind of this unnuanced endorsement of the hijab as if um, someone's decision is fully autonomous when they exist in a culture where the stakes for nonconformity are so right. high. So, so uh, uh, I have the, the former dean, I'm, I'm attending Columbia University, well, I just withdrew to go to a different academic program, but the dean of my school, the non-traditional undergrad school for the last 20 years, is a former Jesuit priest who is gay, and I happened to get him as my professor, my first my first semester, and we really bonded over this this former monastic past. I mean, I, I'm I'm not gay, but like clearly we didn't fit in in our circumstances. But he was a Jesuit priest, and they're like the intellectual creme de la creme of Catholicism. And uh, he was a professor of Islam at Columbia University while he was a Jesuit priest. So clearly, there's a spectrum between you know the kind of well-roundedness of his experience versus mine living on solar panels in mendocino county um <laughs> very much so and i and yeah and that's what i kind of wanted to draw out here was what you know and and you're absolutely right i can agree uh, i'm 100 percent on board with the second generation experience i think the only people that i've heard of who actually try and have made it part of their culture to try to do this more right. I won't, I won't give them 100% props, right. but I'll say that at least they're making an effort in this direction, right. are the Amish. You know, they, they, they kick you out. They go, man, you know, out you go to the world for a couple of years, and then right. you've got to voluntarily come back. And of course, there's going to be some people who are going to have culture shock and are going to, you know, they go into the drinking and the drugs and they freak out and then they come back because they don't. But the know. other thing is, if you choose not to come back, you lose your family. So it's yeah, not you, a very fair. Yes and no, it, it's, it's not quite as black and white as some okay, people think. Okay. Actually, but um, and I actually just recently learned a lot more about that. But um, but at least they make an effort to go look. You're of an age now where you got to go out and see what else the world has because if you're going to do this, well, we decided to do this. You have to decide to do this, not because you were brought up in it, but because it's your decision. Right. I thought that was a pretty enlightened approach, even if they don't get it totally right, and even if yeah, the sentiment. I I agree. The sentiment's good. The execution. Yeah, (laughs) could be better. Yeah, could be better. Uh, But but as far as your experience goes, now let's get back to that. So. What was this about living on solar panels? <laughs> I mean, so, I mean, part of I, our, our, the, the shtick, as I call it, of being hip, sorry, there's a siren going by, uh-huh. but uh, of being hip and contemporary, you know, we were into vegetarianism and being into like sustainability and food goes with that. But also the founder and this traces back to Gandhi, who wanted these small farm communities eat, uh, and was like very anti-modern, anti-technology. There was that element in the Hari Krishnas from the get-go. They've tried to do farm communities, off-grid communities around the world with varying success. The most scandalous community ever was one of these in West Virginia. And I'm sure we'll circle around to that at some point. Well, we will uh, now. <laughs> um, <laughs> murders, all sorts of things went down there. Uh, but so... We were, so my, who became my guru, I, I call him Tom at this point. He changed his legal name to to his title, but his birth name was Tom, and I do not want to refer to him by his title. So, so uh, I find it colloquial and irreverent. So uh, he had this 25-acre property, gorgeous property in the Redwoods of Mendocino County. Um, there was no grid power, so solar panels, we had some cows, we grew food, so on and so forth. And when I was 18, communicating with him from afar, at a certain point, I basically had stumbled into a controversy involving him. And I was like, distraught by it. And his response was like, you should come visit and, you know, I can fully explain all these questions you have kind of thing. So, so I weighed it for a while and and I moved out there with a one-way ticket um in in the end of April 2007 I was 18 and uh that was an adjustment from suburban Baltimore to 
being on uh, this like steep, dry, gorgeous, but trying environment uh you know it was like a two minute hike to to the bathroom from my yurt we lived in yurts mostly um uh yeah um. <laughs> how do they and was this person amassing money or just followers and power like what was his stick what was he trying to do he he uh it, it, you probably get this question a ton, which people pose, which is, are is is the leader a cheater or do they really believe this stuff? Yes. And I think most of the time, and I, but I've wondered if Scientology might be an exception, so I'll ask you. But most of the time, I think it's this in-between where actually the leader is a believer, but they're consciously manipulating people. They're not oblivious to the fact that they're abusing, hurting and and calculating around people's lives but they believe that that is justified by the ends right. and i've always wondered if that might not be the case with scientology because it is such a like like just like you know science fiction written you know as bill burr says there's there's footage of the guy stubbing his toe like oh fuck <laughs> like <laughs> Um, yeah hubbard hubbard uh, my take on that has always been or or has developed into rather that he uh, was a pathological liar uh all his life he he just developed the skill of, of, of of storytelling to a fine art and i think he was well aware of the fact that he was conning people with dianetics yet he was also fighting personal demons and we know this from his personal writings that he never expected to have made public. Um, mm-hmm. And he had very grandiose ideas. He was a very meg- megalomaniac, but very, very, he, he definitely was very aware that he was a very flawed human being. Mm-hmm. And I think he eventually got into a state of mind where he thought that the, the development of the work he'd been doing would cure his problems and, and elevate mm-hmm. him somehow too and he practiced daily i mean with scientology techniques and in the end he had some strokes he went senile and he just was lost the plot entirely and by the time he was dead he was mentally gone so then do you think uh just i'm i've been curious about this what about with david miscavige is he oh no he's not a true believer yeah right okay so i think he used to be right he signed up for it totally believing sure but i think once he saw behind the curtain he realized oh no this is something different and i can take advantage of this very lucrative bullshit yes and so i do think you find some gurus like that i think it's more common in india because in india like in in certain regions like that can be a viable life path in someone's mind as like this is how i'm going to sustain myself just like in in cultures with established monastic cultures especially in the past like joining the monastery was like you know you knew someone who did that with their life (laughs) kind (laughs) of wow Uh, uh like going on i i think of it like going off to war like most of us know someone or, or who's who's been to war like in the time like if you read tolstoy kind of stuff like these highly religious cultures going off to a monastery wasn't uncommon so i think there are some people who you know basically opt into being a god man or occasionally god woman uh as as a, a, a money-making scheme, but certainly with my guru, uh, I think he believed the stuff. He joined in his early twenties. He had a child and a wife at the time, and um, but not no amount of belief. The the the, the fatally flawed belief is that this shit is so important that it justifies destroying people's lives in the immediate. And the, the, the phrase, I don't know if it's a quote from scripture or from the founder of the Hare Krishnas, but basically doing humanitarian work is saving the clothes of a drowning man. So it's like, it doesn't matter how much you're improving someone's material life if you're not saving their soul with spiritual knowledge that will end the cycle of birth and death anything you do for them is a drop in the bucket of, of this many lifetimes of bondage, you know? So 
congratulations, you fed someone's belly today who was otherwise going to die, but what did you do for their soul? <laughs> right. Right. That's a, that's a great expression, what you just said. I've never expressed it that way, although I've, under, I've had my own understanding of that with, with, in relation to Scientology. And that is one of the justifications in the world of Scientology. It's an underlying principle as to why they don't feed the homeless clothe the homeless, deal with, you know, real issues that, that people that, that are really needing help, right. they won't give that help. They don't look at that as even valid help. Right. They look at it as, you know, you're giving somebody a handout. You're not it, exactly the question, what did you do for them spiritually? What did you really do for them? Right. You just threw stuff at them. You didn't, you know, you, you just gave the man the fish. You didn't teach him how to fish. You didn't. And if the ideology is that, that, that like attachment and things are, are bad, you could even be, you know, digging them further. Like, oh, don't make their material circumstance pleasant because what if they like the world more? But right. I, I don't want to forget because I know there are going to be critics listening to this. So I want to be, you know, fair yeah. um, that there are, those kind of endeavors that the Hare Krishnas do take up feeding poor people and stuff. Um, it's not that they're fundamentally opposed to them within, within the community. There will be controversy when that happens as to whether people should be wasting their time that way. And most importantly and insidiously is these have very often been fundraising schemes where only a small portion of those funds go to feeding poor children. This is classic Hare Krishna, like 101, going back decades with their Food for Life organization, which does legitimate feeding here and there. But especially in the past, anyone in the movement might go out on the street and raise money with the Food for Life fundraising spiel or materials they might be living off that. They might be supporting the local temple with that. How much of it's going to what is claimed? And we did this in the offshoot. We we called it Food for All. It was a DBA of our nonprofit. Uh, there was three people in San Francisco who uh, approached us, like like kind of tangential members of the group. They they came up to visit one day, and I was there for all of this, and uh, asked if they could use our nonprofit status to get solicitation permits in the city of San Francisco. So we started this secondary doing business as food for all and would get these permits and they would collect money on, on this premise. And then they lived off of it, just their normal lives. And they gave us a kickback every month because they were using our nonprofit status. And, um, I was involved in this. It wasn't large amounts of money. It was three people living off of it. But I would, you know, I don't want to incriminate. I would, you know, make up expense reports to help get these these permits at the time. And uh, oh wow! So this was just straight up con of the city. Well, it was a con of people. Well, yeah, and then the donors, of course, because they think they're giving them the homeless. Yeah, and so we did that on a on a minuscule scale. It was it was a family of three men who kind of were doing that to support themselves, and we got a very small amount of money just for our you know effortless involvement. But uh, it's a very good example. And also in India, where they have these large feeding programs, they have like this school meal program where they feed like a, a million and a half kids a day, like huge amounts of food. But in Times of India, just a few years ago, published this whole piece. They found, I think, $20 million in misappropriated funds. The food was regularly testing at below acceptable levels through government testing. Meanwhile, Indians are up in arms uh, about feeding children eggs as part of school lunches because a lot of vegetarians in India don't eat eggs. So it's like just this ridiculous... uh, kind of hypocrisy. So I want to give them credit where it's due, which is there are some starving people who do get fed. There are other endeavors, but those are not uh, without their tarnishing. Right. It's not necessarily everything. It's, it, it appears to be on the surface. Right, right. Were there other activities you guys engaged in of a similar nature when you talk about this kind of conning sort of thing? 
Um, in our group, we were very small. We're talking less than 100 active members at any given time across the whole world. Uh, in the property where I was mostly based in California, it would fluctuate. One winter, there was two of us because everyone else was living on other properties uh, to like 15. It was not a large kind of thing. So what I was privy to, and I was the leader's personal assistant too. Um, so what I was privy to was a lot of this on kind of less damning scales just in personal lives, you know, sitting in his right. office talking about, oh, such and such, this person just got a new job, like uh, we can press on them for more donations or this person just got fired. Maybe we can press on them to move their entire family across the country, uh, whatever it may have been, you know, this just like disgustingly entitled plotting other people's lives as if they're objects. And, and I don't want to overly condemn myself. I wasn't a huge like participant or malicious in this. I was often found myself pitted against the leader advocating for something that was in someone's, better interest and him you know screwing with my head and telling me like oh no that person's not actually depressed and i'm like what like it's extreme gaslighting uh <laughs> right so. i you know it's so funny because my first even five years out my first thought as a former Scientologist with what you just said about, you know, getting guys to move across the country or this person just got a raise, let's get more donations out of them. My first thought was, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm like, cause I was so inured to that pattern of operation at myself that I, I really have to step back from it sometimes, even with everything I've learned and everything I know, I still have to step back from it sometimes and go, dude, that's really not normal. People don't do that, you know. It's not catch yourself from giving me pointers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's funny. You know, this is why I enjoy these conversations so much is because I, you know, it helps me, it, you know, gives me, helps give me some perspective on yeah. things that, you know, even five years out, you still just go, oh my God, how am I thinking that way, you know? Yeah, and I, I grapple with, I like to also touch on, you know, some of the after the fact effects. So yeah. like as his personal assistant, I would travel with him um, most of the years I was involved, not always, but so that meant um, people hosting us mostly, that's what this travel was, like him being invited to come speak somewhere. And so we fly in somewhere, there's people there that pick us up, there's like meals prepared, there's like everything under the sun. Not again, to discredit, like I was still the menial slave. Like, you know, it was, it was kind of nice. Cause like I got treated like a human a little bit, uh, during those times, but you know, I still was doing his laundry and massaging his feet and, and ridiculous things like that. Only, um, I should clarify, not sexual things, but, but still very, um, Given yeah. your given your boss foot massages is definitely crossing some lines for me. <laughs> well, <laughs> boss implies okay. employment, and I was the one losing money to to right. stay away from them. So, uh, right. yeah, maybe boss isn't even the right term. It's not quite the same dynamic, right? But but so I would travel with him, and as I left later on, as I left, I. I could see so clearly what this was, you know, like we'd, we'd be hosted, we'd sit down for a meal with a family and then we'd like meet other people. And we, I went to Poland three years in a row with him for a week where he gave like a week of lectures and all of it is just like information gathering. It's just parasitic for him. I mean, like these interactions, he seems to be making small talk. He seems to be asking about how your kids are doing, but it's like whatever is not usable information is just like whoop, whoop, past the filter, you know, or, or caught in the filter. Um, and I also learned how to be make small talk and be more comfortable doing things like that. Later, I was sent out on the road to do sales at like conventions and stuff so that also forced me to get better at kind of just conversing with people but now sometimes if I'm in a new setting and I'm just getting along with people the fact that people are liking me can make me uncomfortable because it's reminiscent of like this ability to schmooze which I I, I shadowed this man while he did for so long and which unknowingly I I assisted by being um, a personable 
you know, I was a good sidekick, you know, I was, especially because he was actually a jerk. So I would find myself kind of picking up the pieces and being the kind one to people who he was dismissive of. Mm. So anyway, that's just, uh, you know, the kind of thing that I think ex-members, it's complex. Like you shouldn't have to uh, be uncomfortable because you're hanging out with people and they're enjoying your company. <laughs> that's for sure. What, okay, what, now well, there was something else you mentioned we needed to circle back to. I just wanted, didn't want to forget anything before we, before I ask you my next question about how you got out of this whole thing. What, okay. was there something else that we needed to cover? Or that you wanted to make sure we. I mean, I think we touched on uh, a few things, but yeah, I guess I. I, I, I didn't keep some notes. I should have probably written. The, it. No, it's all good. The the monastic element. I'm glad that that's clear. Um, oh. the, that I was part of the inner circle, so to speak. I think those are some of the kind of unique aspects of my experience that that also offer some unique insights. We didn't discuss that I was manipulated out of large amounts of money. My well, that's okay. And so let's let's go ahead and talk about that. How did you make well, money? Do it. <laughs> it out of them. What? Did, pray tell. So uh, the Tom, my my former guru, uh, he had some contact with my family before I came on the scene, so to speak. My mom had been to some of his lectures. They had known of each other decades ago, but. Uh, not been involved in the interim, but my mom had been to some of his lectures. My brother, who had gotten super devout, as I mentioned, uh, had also been into Tom for a spell, but eventually chose, you know, a competitor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but so he had some contact with, their fam with our family, and he knew that there was some money. And I didn't come from a wealthy family, but my grandfather was a very successful surgeon who grew up in the Depression and, and busted his ass to make a life. And and thankfully so, because he was able to support us financially when my mom had cancer and multiple sclerosis and all these things. But I had a college fund um, that was, you know, growing up, my grandfather, a, a Jewish doctor, wanted nothing more than to see us all go to college. My mom dropped out of college to move into a temple at 19. And that was devastating to him on some yeah. level. Um, so my whole life, it was like, just so you know, like there's enough money. You can go to any college you want. You can go to any college you want. And I excelled in school until I left it at 13. Um, so my guru was not unaware that there was some funds somewhere connected to our family. Um, about six months after I lived there, God, it was like really insidious, you know, so I moved in. A few months after I moved in, I was made his personal assistant for for various reasons, but in hindsight, the money was a huge one. Um, then I traveled with him and, and the second-in-command to uh, India, North Carolina, and then Costa Rica. It was like months of traveling. We ended up being in Costa Rica for four months straight on a brand-new property, living in tents, um, with hydroelectricity. Like I was working like a, a peone, they call it like a laborer down there, just digging trenches, hauling buckets of water up hills. It was like brutal boot camp, secluded, no internet. And that that was like within my first six months, almost four of them were there. And that was the the, the boot camp. And uh whereas before that began, I was often um, scolded for giving my unsolicited opinion and any number of other things that a normal human is entitled to do. By the end of that trip, I, I was very much like broken down and more reprogrammed into what I knew was expected of me. So I had trained myself because he would, he would propose horrible ideas, stupid ideas or ideas that the implications were like my life would be hell, like in terms of labor. And I had learned that bringing a reasonable feedback to that was not welcome. But I had not, I don't know if I ever fully internalized that I was actually wrong to, to my credit, you know, in these kind of gaslighting situations. But so anyway, we come back from Costa Rica. I received second initiation, which is like a big deal. You get special mantras and you wear a, a thread around your body for the rest of your life. Uh, and Oh, wow. 
I get a yeah. threat. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Status symbols. Uh, in Indian cultural status symbols. Um, it's a caste thing, but it's to make a statement that like we're beyond caste. So here, here's the here's the highest caste thread. But so anyway one day and i can still vividly remember the scene him and the second in command basically approached me on the property in california and they had lured me in partly on the basis of education they saw that i was intellectually inclined and he had talked about sending me to berkeley to learn bengali because they have a bengali program there and then i'd be able to translate scriptures and so part of the seduction process was like we are going to support your intellectual life uh yeah. and they talked about training me to be an editor doing this certification that this other woman had done so they approached me about doing community college and i forget exactly how he words it but the bottom line is i sign up for community college online claim that i'm living in the town where the school is and renting a room from other group members so that i can get a monthly stipend from my from my college fund, which then goes to the temple because really I'm living there and the education will cut into my slave time, which it didn't. I just had to squeeze in my academic work around the edges of 16 hour days. Um, so that's how the initial scheme cooked up. I was into the idea of doing school, certainly. So I signed up for community college and for the better part of the next seven years, I had this monthly stipend come and signed over the entire amount to the temple in a check, just month after month after month. And I continued doing school, we would drag it out. So, so I was enrolled over, I believe, six years in community college and never finished an associate's degree. I was two and a half credits short. Uh, I did maintain a 4.0 because I was very still attached to my my grades. Uh, so that served me well once I applied later. But so so this money scheme, so insidious, we drove down to Santa Rosa, California in Sonoma County where two of the householder members lived. And we wrote up a fake rental agreement, a month to month rental agreement with them. Uh, you know, we did some research, like what's the most we can reasonably claim I'm paying for a room in this area. You know, let's pretend I'm going to shop at Whole Foods every week. Let's write that into the, the bill kind of thing. Uh, and then that was set up and basically functioned without impediment. And every semester he would try to get me to not enroll in classes at all, but keep the money coming. And I was uncomfortable with that. This, this whole thing hinges on my deception of my grandfather and, and like his accountant and, and the people I was in contact with. Additionally, part of this scheme was I need a car to commute between the monastery and college that I'm not actually attending. So I bought the already owned Prius that the temple already owned. So it was just a way of just getting an extra $15,000 in one swoop out of my, out of my funds. This is, this is, this is, this just pisses me off. All this right? crap just pisses me off. Do they have any dogma that relates to honesty? Of course. I mean, I'm just wondering. Don't I, they just, all? I, I mean, maybe Don't they all? You know, I just thought, <laughs> well, how hard was it to rationalize this? You know, of course you're going to rationalize me it. Or for him? Both, I guess. For him, he was ever angling for more he was I, yeah i don't imagine it was difficult right. for him to for, you know, for me this stuff for me i i was very uncomfortable with it and i would remember having times where i'd think like well when my funds get down to like this amount i should figure out a way to like stop handing them over because i don't necessarily you know like he had talked about me going to berkeley how is that ever going to happen we're broke as fuck in the group if, if, if this is true that I'm ever going to have like a, a, an, an education, even if I remain as a monk, I'm going to need some funds. So I would think things like that. Um, so just to, just to be clear, just from the money that my grandfather had made for, you know, I gave over $120,000 of that in these years. Um, and that's over a six not, year period. 
and that's not including free labor and that's not including paid labor where I was also handing the pay over to them when I would work outside and do, do actual normal oh. work where, where I was okay. making money and I was good at that work too. So, so, you know, it's, it's hard. It, you can't quantify, uh, you know, seven right. years of your life being robbed. But, uh, if I were to it'd be, <laughs> it'd be getting up there in the six digits pretty well, um, you know, the insidiousness of this sort of thing is really rough, too, because all of this, if you tried to bring some kind of suit, if you tried to go after this guy, I mean, one, he probably doesn't even have the money anymore. And two, all of this is going to get thrown out of a courtroom in about a day on First Amendment. Well, I did initially look a little into this. Mm -hmm. um, I contacted a lawyer in California who has experience with cultic cases. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't thrilled with the brief discussion we had, to be, to be honest, um, or like how much I felt listened to or not. But the bottom line, what he said, which I've since heard some, some things that make me question if that was accurate, was basically a statute of limitations for the kind of thing I was talking about with the finances would be two years because I was over 18 when it began. So, so you're talking about trying to prove coercion of an adult and you're right. It's a whole shit show. And at this point I've left the group. I'm living on the other side of the country and to pursue legal action would be to be tied up in this stuff in California where would, where it'll also involve digging into my life and the people I've been closest with for the last decade, pulling out anything they possibly can to not only discredit me in the court, but in, 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 you know, their very limited public. <laughs> right. Right. No, it's a, it's a, it's a thing that law is on their side on this. And it's, it's rough for people to hear that because they want to think that the law brings justice. It doesn't. They want to think that there is some recourse available to people who have been victimized by spiritual gurus and leaders and, and whatnot. There isn't. There is no recourse yeah. for that. And yeah. that's and why like what we're doing, talking, speaking out, making people aware of this, that's the recourse. That is. It's the, it's the, that's what I say. The only, not the only, but generally the court of public opinion is, is the place where you can harm them. And it's the place that can eventually force the court of legal justice. You know, right. when like Nexium became this very visible thing and then you know they started working on it like exactly so so yeah we're <laughs> doing god's work as they say <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's go ahead and, and move into the last phase of this here, and then we'll wrap up. What got you, what, what woke you up, man? How did you like go, wait a minute, what the hell am I doing? I'm giving over all this money. I'm slaving to this guy. You know, at one, how old were you when you finally went, wait a second, what's up? And how did you get out of this? Yeah. Uh, just to, to answer the details, I was 23 when I moved out of the monastery itself and like decided I was no longer going to be a monk. I was 25 when I had what I call the conceptual break where I knew I was done with, with the whole thing, uh, ideology, people, community, all of it. So when I initially left, um, oh yeah, my story gets juicier and juicier. <laughs> so uh, aside from like the years I was involved, you know, there would be times when I was so extremely depressed, but I didn't even have the label for that. And there would be times where I'd think things like, what are the chances that I was born into like the one true religion for all intents and purposes. And within that, I found the best dude out of all of them as we viewed him. Like, like at a certain point I was like, I'm like the right hand man to Jesus. That seems statistically improbable. So I would have these kind of, <laughs> you think, <laughs> <laughs> Hey, but someone's got to do it. That's right. Hey, you can't <laughs> win if you don't play, you know, but uh, I would have these thoughts like that or, or various things, but none of them ever reached any kind of critical mass in uh, I guess it was late 2011. Um, I was 20, 
22, about to turn 23. I think my mom was dying and I flew home. She was uh, in intensive care. Um, her cancer had returned and, and spread to her brain. And then she got put on hospice care and the guru was trying to talk me into flying back. Cause I, and luckily the second in command kind of stepped in and was like, just let him stay, you know? And sure enough, she, she passed away two weeks later. Um, so I got to stay and I was there for that, but I was extremely lonely and depressed and, and all these things. And I, you know, went online and I discovered OkCupid and I made an OkCupid profile while I was a monk. And, uh, Oh, you bad, bad boy. This is the tip of the iceberg. Trip. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I met someone like immediately who I really hit it off with, like in like substantial ways. And we talked every day for like weeks and she wanted to meet. And I was like too neurotic to even meet like, like, like physiologically, I couldn't handle the notion that I'd like meet this woman in public, especially because I'm doing something that I'm so not supposed to be be doing. Um, eventually, we did meet, and I secretly lost my virginity as a monk with immense amounts of shame and, and whatnot following it. And then I moved back to California. You know, I, I was there for like a month total. My, we had my mom's memorial service, et cetera, and I moved back to California, and that was that. Uh, a year and a half or two later, I found myself starting to get sent out on the road. Well, I visited my grandparents, but I was being sent out by the monastery to make money. We were do working a lot of state fairs and like trade shows, you know, all these fly by night, you don't need an education type of money making scheme. So I was selling bed sheets and pillows. Uh, <laughs> I did it in LA. Uh, all over the country, really, but that gave me some some freedom and mobility. And I was, I at that point had like started meeting women online again. So I'm just like talking. I mean, like living in a yurt in the middle of nowhere. But I would end up like bonding with people and 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 forming like relationships where we would communicate for months on end. And at a certain point, with this additional freedom of traveling, and by then I was the manager of the California monastery, so I could basically elect myself to be the one to get sent off to work and, you know, wipe my hands of the headache that was being there on the property. Um, I ended up having the opportunity to like meet some of these women and like, it's so, so basically it eventually got to this point where I was really living a double life. So I was just saying less than having shame about the fact that I, I was attracted to women and wanted both emotional and physical intimacy in my life, I, I had a lot of shame about the hypocrisy. I was at this point, the right hand man to the guru, I wore the orange robes, I traveled with him, I wrote articles, I, you know, I internally, I recognized that my position was largely one of practical consideration, like I was good at the job. But with that position in that setting comes the assumption that you're like spiritual, you're this or that for for the group members you know what i mean and uh that really weighed on me and eventually also communicating with one of these women who i'm still friends with and we've never even met uh she kind of encouraged me i still have the emails there's they're they're very touching like clearly this isn't unhealthy for you. this is unhealthy for you at this point like so on and so she gave me the courage to basically say that i didn't want to be a monk anymore and even then, I was not comfortable doing that in person, probably in part, I sensed that he would, you know, mind fuck me, and I'd come out changing my mind. But uh, so I started crafting an email over like the course of a few weeks, while I was still on the property, and running a festival, we had like our biggest annual event coming up, which was like, 80 people for 10 days on solar power in the woods. It's a big, it's complicated. Uh, and I knew that I was plotting to not leave the group, but leave being a monk. And so then I was, after that festival, I left to go work in LA for the month. And that's when I wrote him this email that basically I came clean, that horrible me, I've had sex and so on and so forth, but I'm still fully devoted to the, to the cause. I want to continue making money for you, so on and so forth. So how we then presented it to the community at large was that I was about to start a business focused on money making and that's not 
a monastic lifestyle, so I was gonna switch into the white, the white robes, which is how they distinguish monks or lay people, so to speak. Um, but everyone knew better because people been around the block. All these people were monks uh, who failed themselves <laughs> once upon a time. But everyone was like very supportive. I moved back to to Maryland to kind of regroup. Was the plan? My grandparents were still there. But instead, uh, some 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 money making opportunities kept falling into my hands. So I, I ended up running mall kiosks immediately that winter <laughs> for the group, and then I started this business um, of home home cheese making kits because in the group I had started making cheese because we had cows. It was that kind of lifestyle. So I started this business and it was viable, and I was still fully dedicated to the group. I had my first like serious girlfriend at that time and she was not in the group, but very respectful and kind of cool with it. But we eventually split up because she felt like she would always be second priority, um, which at the time was, was, was accurate. So after that, I moved to North Carolina. I was basically trying to continue working, making money, giving a portion to the group, find a relationship and that was not working for me uh living on my own in western north carolina at this point this was i moved there in 2014 and something just like wasn't adding up trying to meet people trying to make friends and date i was realizing like oh the the degree to which i value this person's like what they have to offer is like capped at a certain point because they're not a group member, because they don't know all this stuff I spent the last seven years pouring into my head. Uh, and, and at a certain point, that made me unhappy. And, and I had also started smoking pot a little bit again, and I had immense shame about that. And it caused me to not participate in the community as much. I was an hour from one of the properties, and, and I got really depressed. And it was just like all very jumbled, unclear, um, that then led into just the most intense emoting I'd ever known. Like, I didn't know that existed prior to this point. Like, insomnia, like, like wailing for hours at night, just really confused about where, where all this was arising from. And a friend found a therapist for me because I, like, couldn't even bring myself to Google things and I had let my business kind of fall into disrepair my online orders I wasn't filling them so my store my Amazon and my Etsy stores got shut down I was just like struggling and uh, I eventually started therapy and then it was I, I was joking with people at the time like yeah you know I'm seeing like ways in which the temple was unhealthy and and things that that we can do to improve still very much identifying with the community but I would joke that like I I feel like I could only be headed for a faith crisis that seems like the next step <laughs> in the, in the, in the, sounds like you I mean to me it sounds like you were deeply into your faith crisis already I don't think I had so so with guru groups I think especially there can be a tendency to blame everything else around it you can you know oh, yeah. you have to you blame the second in command you blame it not just guru groups you're right but uh i was so close to the center that at a certain point i had to acknowledge this shit was by design this wasn't an accident all these ways in which my mind was basically disadvantaged to function in the normal world now and the way i was I, you know like the subtle biases that were cultivated in me none of this was like oops let's figure out how to correct that that's not something we want as part of the package it, it was by design by the leader exclusively and i was walking in the woods with some friends and i had that realization and I mean the the, the term I, I thought to myself like he didn't love me unconditionally and like I almost physically collapsed in that moment it was like because because I, I it crystallized in my head like the contract of the guru disciple relationship is like I mentioned earlier I give you everything and you do what's in my best interest it's supposed to be in theory this this symbiotic altruistic thing and and i knew that i sincerely gave everything i could 
to, to, to the process or whatever you want to call it. And I also at that point realized that had he had my best interests at heart, for one, he would have encouraged me to leave the monastery years before I did because I was really struggling in, in certain ways. And, and so I realized like, oh no, he had an agenda. And that day I had like my first panic attack when I got in the car and I was driving home. And then I had a second panic attack that night. And then like the next day I could finally sleep again after weeks. And like there was some, some degree of, of breakthrough. And after that day, I gave myself permission to take as much distance and time as I needed. Um, and not feel obligated to donate money or anything. I just, I gave myself that permission. I still believed in the thing. I still, whatever. But uh, not too long after, I discovered this book called The Guru Papers. My my therapist suggested I read Siddhartha, which I don't know if, oh, yeah. if you've read. I, I still haven't read it. I found it too slow. I, I, I remember it from high school. Right. Her, so, Herman Hesse, right? So, yeah. So I dropped out of middle school. So I didn't read it. Uh, but I went to look for it because he basically said my life was reminding him of it because I was a monk. I then like, you know, had like a sexual double life. I don't even know the story really. But and then I had also um, at that point gotten into some legal trouble for marijuana that was still tied into the group. I was trying to make money for the group with another group member. So all these things combined, my therapist was like, you should read Siddhartha. So, so I went to look for it at the used bookstore. And instead this, this book was looking me in the face called the guru papers, masks of authoritarian power. And it's uh, written by this couple. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's excellent. Um, one of them is a psychotherapist. I forget what the other one is. And they were at one point involved in Esalon Institute, which was this like therapeutic institution in California that became kind of like went off the rails, cultic itself, experimental. So this book, it's not about gurus in the Eastern sense, their argument is that gurus are the strongest example of authoritarian control without physical coercion that exists. So they use that as the example. And so I'm reading that and I, I was thinking in my head, I was like, and I was his right hand man. Fuck. <laughs> like, uh, right. So it's divided into a section about that and then a, a, a section about authoritarian ideologies and a section about authoritarian institutions. And right. just reading the introduction, I was sitting on my couch and, and I had pieced together enough that the introduction just, I say like, like a keystone, just like and in that moment I knew, oh my God, I'm done with this forever everyone I've spent my last decade with, people who I've grown up with, people who I was raised with, my brother who's still a believer, uh, like my relationship to all of this is different from this moment onward. And I also knew that first night that I wanted to, to, to say something because I had been part of the, the inner circle. And even though I hadn't been malicious, I was a... a, a <laughs> you know, like a prominent cog in this abuse machine. And I felt like I had to do what I could to kind of set that straight. Um, but I couldn't get off my couch at, at the time. Um, and a friend found me. There happened to be an Cultic Studies Association event for second generation former members, this annual event in Connecticut. And it happened to be two weeks from then when I was living in North Carolina. And I called and they said it was full. And I called again a couple days later and I was like, I, I need it. Like, I don't need to stay at the place. I don't need to eat the food. I just need the content. And um, a spot had opened up. So I got permission from the courts to leave the state. This is all like this very compressed timeline of, of my life in shambles. And uh, by the end of that workshop, I was in this terrifying space where those were like the only people in the world except for like a therapist and one other friend who knew who I was and they were strangers to me, you know? Uh, so then I developed a bit of an online support network. I created a secondary social media account for a while so I could interact with ex-members candidly and, and whatnot. 
And then after my first conference, which was uh, the Cultic Studies Conference in Sweden in 2015, I came home and rumors had spread, word had gotten to the guru that I was being deprogrammed and I was suicidal and I was having panic attacks every day and all these like inflated um, notions. So I, I fly back into America to an email from him and the two other kind of inner circle members who I had been close with. And I was like, okay, now's the time. This is it. Uh, this is the time for me to speak out. So the form that it took was a public response to his letter. I, I included his entire letter piece by piece in, in, in blue text. And I just broke it down, complete transparency about the group, the financial dealings. There had recently been a suicide of, of a member in the group. I, I just laid it all out there, started a blog and shared it on Facebook and, and let the shit hit the fan um, in 2015. And that remains the, the best thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> awesome, man. That is, that is an awesome story. I, I, you know, I am, uh, I, there are so many parallels with us on, yeah. on various aspects of it. But, uh, yeah, when we, when was, we met in LA, we didn't get to talk much, but I, I remember thinking like, he hasn't been out so long relative to a lot of people in this scene. And, and he's very, um, you seem very, you know, stable in a new life. And that was encouraging for <laughs> well, me. It was an apparency. <laughs> well, you know Steve how it goes. the key word there, but I, uh, but, but I, you know, but for sure, education. Well, I mean, you have you a know, couch. Support. I can see you. You clearly have a couch, so you're doing okay. I, yeah, I, I got a couch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sleeping on solar panels. That is true. <laughs> Yeah, no, man, but it's uh, seriously, it's actually kind of inspiring, um, you know, what you're talking about there, because you did get yourself out of that situation. You know, nobody was dragging you out. You weren't deprogrammed. You didn't have family to fall back on. And, and I only understand to a degree what that feels like. I mean, I definitely understand the subjugation, the slave labor, the, I mean, I definitely get all that. Yeah. Sea Org was 100% like that. Um, but man, the force of will it takes, I don't know that people really appreciate, especially for second gen, um, to be able to even contemplate stepping out, much less gearing out the actions to do so, you know? It was, it, yeah, I do. And, and people will often say like, oh, it's so brave. And, and I agree, but the, the felt experience was just desperation it was yeah. it was like psychological life or death if not physical life or death eventually you know um and but it harrowing i mean like nothing i've ever like a solid nine months and and beyond but like a very well defined nine months of of just just devastation and like hopelessness and Fortunately, so fortunately, I was in contact with a variety of ex-members, including former Hare Krishnas, from very early on, and that was some evidence. I was like, okay, these people, I feel understood by them, and they're claiming it can get better. And like, I, I really held on to that with certain people um, to, to get through those times. But yeah, and yeah. then I, I, I was stuck. Uh, I... I I mean, no, I have no legal record. It was like a thing where basically you do what they tell you and then you're never tried. And it was, but I was stuck in the state for a year, right as I left the call over a year. And so it was like the second whammy of, of I still don't have my freedom. I, I, you know, I still have to like pee in a cup and get permission to cross state lines. And um, so finally when that led up, and then I was like, all right, I've been thinking about schools and I working in a cafe and, and I took this five month road trip, which in the, is the context that I met you actually. I, I was on the West Coast during that event. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a wild ride. I don't know if you, if you have the experience on, on any given day, I can just at almost any given moment, I can just like be struck by like, whoa like none of this was supposed to be life <laughs> in a good way in a very yep. good way yep it, but but the normal the the banal like any any number of things can can remind me of that fact 
Yeah, it's I, I totally understand. <laughs> Every day is kind of a new learning experience uh, in so many ways for me, uh, you know. Yeah, and, and I, I think it'll be interesting to observe over time, you know, how how things change the longer ones out and whatnot. Uh, you know, I just, I, I've made the first week of July, my kind of anniversary, because that's when I published this, this piece originally. Uh, so I just passed, I guess, three years from that date. And how, how old are you? Uh, 29. Okay. So I, I will say that you, you good for getting out in your twenties. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I mean, you still have your whole life ahead of you and that's a good thing. You know, yeah. I, I didn't get out to my 40s. I feel in some ways disadvantaged because of that in some fashion. But on the other hand, I feel like there's some, there's been a bit more maturity to deal with some of what I've run into. But only just, you know, right. Right. I, you know, it's not, it's not like it's a, it's not like there's some scale that you're on and I'm on and we're going to compare. Right. Difference. You know what I mean? But right. I'm, and I think, you know, people like to try to find the silver linings, which is a, an important endeavor. But I do, you know, and especially I don't know all the details, but in my story at a glance, you know, I got to live in Costa Rica. I went to Poland three times. I, uh, you know, milked cows and made cheese. And, uh, <laughs> and that's well, cool you know, stuff. It, there's but, nothing. Let's let's just say that there's nothing wrong with taking stock of an experience and keeping the good and throwing away the bad. I don't think. Right. My point is just that uh, the point that I make back to people is that's true, but none of these experiences were exclusive to an abusive environment. They could have been had without all the collateral damage. They they could have been had without the expense. You know, I spent... I spent upwards of one hundred and twenty thousand dollars to not finish an associate's degree. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's just fucked up. And that's, <laughs> like I said, that just that shit just pisses me off. Seven days a week, I just am, I'm endlessly. I, I I have limited access to anger, and so when I get it, I savor it. Uh, that's that's where I'm at. Well, it's interesting. You know, I actually brought that up. Um, uh, I'll only speak very, very generally about this, but um, because it was a, a, a private group that we were talking in when I was at the ICSA conference this, you know, a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Um, but I was able to bring up the subject of anger uh, because often in this, in, in in a general statement of my own limited experience with this. Um, I saw a lot of emphasis on the grief, the anxiety, the depression, the, the you know, that, those aspects of the recovery. And they're valid and they have to be talked about. And you have to experience that. And you have to go through all that. But I saw no one ever bringing up the, the anger. And I brought that up and, I was, and, I was, and it was great. It was, let's just say it was a very productive group meeting. Yeah. Bringing yeah. that up. I, my, my stance, also ridicule, ridicule is a, a, a healing one, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. yep. but, but my, I was just talking with a friend about this the other day, because there's things that I say that like I have regret for, or, or I feel guilt for my involvement with, and, and some people disagree with that, but my experience was my emotional range was so constricted for years that all of a sudden when I got out and like the floodgates opened quite literally for the, the first while, um, just like I was saying before, like nothing's unnatural. The full range of emotions are part of the human experience. I, I believe they all have some place where they're appropriate and I'm okay with living with some some sense of of guilt or that like yeah i could have done something better or differently specifically in relation to this friend who who commits suicide i'm okay with living with that feeling i'm not trying to to get it away or 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 transcend it or something like that and and that's another one of those things where post extremism just accepting becomes so liberating whereas it can be distressing for for people um like uncertainty becomes almost comforting for me in in some realms i believe me i understand (laughs) totally understand yeah and and maybe this is a reflection of that you tell me um 
you know, hitting one day on this on this statement that I've made many, many times since. Um, you know, the statement that the three most important words in critical thinking are I don't know. Mm. You know, that to be able to acknowledge that right. and, and that it's okay. You know, you don't have to have the answers for everything. You don't have to have the all powerful, all knowing, all seeing idea. You know? And really the the beauty, I was speaking with a friend who was saying, basically trying to equivocate uh, religious dogma with like dogma that will occur in science and, and academia. But the fundamental difference is the theory of science. This is, this is the beauty of it to me is that there actually is never a conclusion reached if, if understood properly, it is just, this is where like, you know, if tomorrow something defied gravity, it doesn't mean that science is wrong. It means that they didn't have sufficient data. And, and so there is this openness to self-correction, whereas religious dogma does not have that built in. Exactly. That's exactly right. The only time you see change like that is, <laughs> we touched on it very briefly earlier. The only time you see change in dogma is when the um, is, is when the group is trying to become more mainstream. Right. So when the shit people. hits the fan. That's right. That's right. Damage yeah. control or like, or like, you know, they realize that that building needs more than two residents to keep it <laughs> operating. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, there's one last thing I'd like to comment on or get your, actually get your comment on about this. And then, then I think we'll wrap up. Um, clearly throughout the, the narrative of your story, there were a number of places where you took small steps. You got online. You formed an OkCupid okay account. I mean, that's huge. You met someone. You, yeah. you know, got to travel a bit. You got out and about. You had it, you started having communications, significant communication with, you know, meaningful communication right. with right. people outside the group. Uh, which of course these groups discourage heavily because it's you know it's us versus them sort of sort right. of thinking. Uh, but it still took years of doing that, like kind of build up, build up, build up. It's kind of a snowball sort of thing. Yeah. Would you agree that that's that tends to be how this goes, as opposed to you know people thinking you know people who've not had this experience, sort of thinking, well, I should just be able to talk them out of it. There should be an epiphany moment. There should be a there should be a, not an epiphany moment, but there should be a, 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 a you know, a, a, a moment, a, a, a thing that, ha you know, that I should be able to do to them that will somehow turn the you know, light bulb moment. Oh, right. yeah, okay, that's what it is. Do you think it's, it's, you know, that the experience really is more of a gradual process or, you know, in terms of getting people out of these situations? I, I think that it can be very personal. I think that almost always it's, it's gradual that can vary immensely and you know we see people leave and go back we see we got, I see people leave and get the kind of education that you and I are interested in and like understand these topics and go back it's really perplexing to me um, really you've seen somebody actually go back oh yeah wow I've, I've, I, I have not I have not seen that with my group but I've, I've yeah I, I oh yeah so I do think for most people it's gradual. The length of that gradation, I think, varies a lot. Um, I also think that once you're out, you look back and things take on a new significance, you know? Yes. Um, uh, like the thing where I'm like, oh, this is statistically improbable that this is the most spiritual man on the planet and I'm his servant. Like, that's a pretty good realization that that came and went at the time. <laughs> exactly. Um yeah, I do think it's gradual. There was something you said at the beginning of that question that I can't recall that I had wanted to touch on. Oh, well, maybe it'll... Well, I, I talked about the gradual process. I talked about the reaching out into the world. I talked about how you have meaningful conversations with people outside. The oh, world. yeah. I, I just wanted to mention um, there was a great piece. I believe it was in The Atlantic. Uh, it's called Deconversion by Twitter. And it's about Michelle Phelps Roper, the, the woman. Oh, yeah. Megan. Westboro. Megan. 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 Yeah. Phelps, uh, who grew up in the Westboro Baptist Church and has left and and gives excellent uh, talks and things about the subject. Uh, so it was her story of falling in love with this dude that she met on Twitter 
through because she ran the the you know the 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 rage machine Twitter account that they had for the group. And then people started messaging her. And then some people started messaging her like a human and actually like interacting with her. And this guy was one of them and they would go back and forth and back and forth. And, and then in it, she describes eventually they started playing words with friends together for, for months. And literally I did this. There was a woman, we played words with friends and there was like a chat function on the side and, and we talked for months and months and eventually we met several times and, and and we're still friendly to this day uh so that reading that i was in tears it's just, just like this is exactly and so eventually now she's married to that that guy uh it's a pretty charming story oh that's very sweet i did not know her backstory but it does bring to mind something i actually was talking to seth andrews about uh the thinking atheist on a podcast he did recently mm about cults, and I'll just reiterate it here and, I, and maybe get your feedback on this, which is um, you never, you know, the, the important thing for family and friends of people who get involved in these groups is maintaining communication, you know, keeping in touch on whatever friendly level you can, because once you cut it off, it's gone. Yeah, you know, the chances of coming of it of of being able to resuscitate it are much. It's much more difficult. Yeah, I, words with I, the words with friends sort of embodies that for me. In what sense? Well, the sense that you're just friendly, oh, right, right, mean, almost meaningless, and yet not really because gradually it becomes meaningful. Right, exactly. You know, here's a format. Here's a forum where a person is able to communicate. Maybe eventually some pretty deep seated stuff. Right. You know, but it starts with it's just a social little game. It's nothing. It's it's completely insignificant, and yet it actually could make the difference for this person. Right. I was probably. I wonder if I was playing words like "help me" excessively. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I mean, you, you know, that's that's kind of a thing. But I think that's. But, really but I think you're 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 definitely right. I I I think of it as like the barrier of exit as opposed to the barrier of entry. Like it, yes. if family. It's, it's humiliating for many people there 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 is a humiliating component to to um feeling like you've been duped even though it's it 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 was a very you know natural response to manipulation and 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 recruitment uh so if your family or whoever you know on the outside is additionally you know the 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 emotional memory you have of them is also ridicule like it's just going to be harder and harder um, I don't know. I, it's hard for me to put my myself in the shoes of a lot of the, the typical kind of family members that come to the kind of events we go to. My brother's still religious, but we have an all right relationship. He knows where I stand. No one is is aggressively digging in his pockets. You know, he has an Xbox. He it was a very different life than than mine when I was serious about it. Um, so I'm not too concerned. Like it's at that point in many ways, I, I think that, you know, there's notions I have of, of success and flourishing that um, he might never pursue, but that's okay. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool, man. Well, thank you very much for all your time. Yeah. I, I, I guess I was supposed to talk a lot. I feel self-conscious now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought you did great. It's been a pleasure. It really, uh, since we first met, I thought, you know, I, it's funny when we were setting this up, I, I pulled up a, our Facebook messenger and it had like this long message I had typed out, but had never finished sending where I was saying like, Hey, I was thinking it'd be nice to maybe do a podcast with you. I'm trying to get more comfortable speaking about these things. So here we go. Well, there we are. Well, I'm glad I could, uh, glad I could help, I guess. And, uh, yeah. you know, but I, but more importantly, I think that it's, I think, uh, I, you know, thank you for the education on the Hare Krishnas and on, you know, your experience with that. I, I, I got I some great that. books if you want to learn more. <laughs> <laughs> well, I might, I might actually be checking out that guru papers. I got a little stack of books here to get through. I, I so highly recommend it. It's a compilation of essays. So it's very accessible. It's right. meant to be for general readership. And I have a PDF. If you remind me, I'd be happy to send to you, but awesome. It's worth the purchase. Well, 
I'm reading this one right now called Intelligent Disobedience. And uh, I hope to get this guy in my podcast if I can. He's, uh, he's an ex-Scientologist, actually, but he doesn't talk about that at all. It's not his thing. It's not his shtick. He's not into talking about it. He just does um, this, this consulting work on being a, uh, what he calls a courageous follower. And then he brought up this whole point on intelligent disobedience. And it's all about not being in a cult mindset. You know, fascinating. Yes, as a follower. So it's uh, so it is. It's 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 fascinating stuff. So anyway, that's uh that's the show cool. for today, guys. Thanks for coming around. Uh Nitai, thank you very much for your for your uh speaking. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. All right, man. Do you have any questions, comments, feedback, good, bad, or sideways in the comment section on YouTube or at sensiblyspeaking.com? I definitely look forward to that. And if you like this channel and like what I'm doing and think it's educational, informative, and entertaining, then please sign up with Patreon to help keep me, help keep me doing this because it's your guys' support that keeps the channel going. All right. It's I, Joseph, and I endorse this message. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye, guys. All right.